Whenever we're creating anything, it's always important to do background research and ideation stages. Now, even though the effect we're going to be creating is fairly basic in some ways, we still it's still a good idea to sort of look at what's out there, use the trends and the audience you're kind of aiming for. Now, because Spark AR is deployed for Instagram and Facebook, straight away we can start to draw conclusions on what the kind of audience or user group may be. So we're going to be using a fixed target tracking system alongside a face mesh. So we've got to think about users accessibility and users interface uh, options essentially within the limitations of Spark AI itself. So we want, ideally we want to make sure that the user is uh, clear on how they're going to use it. So this is where we kind of come down to this whole background research stage. So it's always a good idea to look at what's already out there on the market, see how people or what other people have found the solutions to tell people what to do, how to engage, and any troubleshooting steps they may have to follow. Uh, bear in mind that Spark AR does not really like using text, so you can't really just say, press this button or do this by some text. You've got to think a bit more creatively than that. So this is where looking at what's already out there, what are the filters, uh, speaking and becoming part of a great community can really help in this situation. So I've always sort of found it easier and preferable for me to do my sort of design and ideation stage on physical media. So I tend to either draw on a whiteboard or draw on some paper an idea of how I think the user's journey should go from when they log into their software, like if it's Instagram or Facebook and how the interaction is going to be made clear to them. It's no good having buttons or interactable objects that are too small because how is the user going to be able to realistically touch it if they've got quite large fingers, for example, and you don't necessarily know what device they're using. So one limitation we know straight away is that Spark AR, you can't use object tap and screen tap at the same time, for example. So that can take into account how you would develop your sort of engagement or interaction options in that regard. We've also got to bear in mind that certain device resolutions will also cause things to look a bit different, a little bit unexpected. Uh, we've got to work in layers, so we've got to think about how we're going to create these components and create these artifacts, the order and the naming conventions we need to follow. Again, the more we can get right and the more we can think about this at the early stage, the easier our life will be when we get to the actual sticking it all together. So whilst this sort of stage is sort of can be seen as a little bit um, tiresome or boring for some people, it's critical in order to get your final product to be as effective as possible. If you rush in, you can cause yourself headaches down the line. So I've always personally preferred the iterative design approach, which basically means I sort of will build a prototype, review it, and then build upon it and improve it in the future. And I'll keep doing this until I get to a version that I'm quite happy with. It's always good to have a kind of test audience as well and test on various different devices. So for a lot of people, you may only have your own device if you're testing your filter. And it may seem to work perfectly fine for yourself, but it may not work for others. Now, Spark AR does allow you to share your filters with others. Uh, I believe it's up to a thousand or so um, sort of impressions or views before it needs to be published. Uh, and you can share this link to people by the channel of your choice. Um, when you preview things in the Spark AR player, do bear in mind that does not necessarily truly represent the final result. So again, I put personal tips is draw it out on paper, think about the user audience, think about their target device, think about what interactions you want and what advantages or problems that you could foresee, and then try and propose solutions. So for our effect, which is going to be using two cameras, we need to think of a way of making it clear to the user that they need to scan an image for the effect to trigger. And then they need to swap the camera for the effect to become noticeable. So this is where our challenge comes in because we've got to do this without text. And we've also try and got to keep our file size fairly small. So optimization is also going to be something that is critical as we go along. So although this, we're not actually yet even touching the software, we're starting to think about the process before we get sit down in front of a computer. Because again, the more you do it now, the easier your life will be later. 
and that's the way we're going for it. So in future videos, we'll be moving actually onto the PC and starting to create these assets digitally and taking what I've been up to this point, just doodles on a piece of paper into a digital artifact. Now, like I said in the introductory overview video, I will be using the Adobe packages, but you could use any package of your choice. I'm only using it for personal ease of use because I actually just have access to it. It's readily available to myself. Again, you can do a lot with a little. I always encourage, especially people who, um, like myself, I started off with basically a broken laptop and I had to uh, go out and meet clients, to just work with what you've got and then basically experiment from that. You learn a lot by doing, not necessarily learning a lot by watching. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to infuse and put across in my videos. So I'll see you in the next part. And, up and, and the sort of little homework task, so to speak, is just draw, think about the user steps that they'll take from pressing this button to returning and resetting it before you put it into Spark. And that will easily start to think of the potential issues you'll come to. Try and think logically. Now, I know it's sometimes not necessarily easy to think logically when you're trying to also think creatively, but that's the kind of challenge, uh, getting a nice balance between the two. Uh, look what other filters are out there and try and deconstruct how those created is a good way of learning how to create new unique ones from scratch. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you next time.